Ready to go. All right, couple announcements. First, test on Thursday. Test will start here at 2.30. Bring pens, pencils, eraser, <coughs> pencil leads, calculator, ruler, highlighters, all whatever writing utensils you want to bring, that's fine. No book, no notes. Notes will be provided in the sense that there will be an equation sheet given to you. Extra paper will be given to you. Bring a green Scantron, a green Scantron. We're talking about those narrow ones. If you are SDS, if you're not, you can tune out for the next 30 seconds. If you're SDS, head over. Don't show up here. Show up over next door in Lewis Hall 109. It's directly across from Lewis 108, which is the main physics office. There will be one of your graders there who will who will proctor. Um, for everybody else, show up here. We'll start at 2.30. The test will be geared for individuals to get done in an hour and um, give you an extra 15 minutes. So there will be a 25 question multiple choice. There will be four problems, one small, three bigger. Um, there will be a review session tomorrow um, in that horrible place, Turner Center 209, um, probably one of the worst classrooms on campus, but um, that's what we got. So from 4 to 5.15, 5.30, we'll review more. Today is a review lecture. We will go over the test from last uh, summer which is what we're gonna do now. Um, let me get this. All right, so this is what the test looks like. All right, that looks good, that looks good. It's got the first test, if anybody's ever to, uh, able to find a copy from like seven years ago, it had nothing really on the front page, just a name and student ID. Um, now it looks a little bit like um, a contract. Read the test thoroughly before you really get started. It will, the test will end at 345. At 345, I'm picking up tests. At 350, I'm no longer picking up tests. So if you if it's not physically in my hands by 350, we're done. Um, I appreciate good penmanship. So I know the penmanship of my niece is horrible, but she's eight. What's your excuse? So write cleanly. I it makes me happy. Um, I am not a psychic. We all know how upset you guys get when if any professor says. It could be easily shown that and skips 10 steps and then writes down an answer. You guys don't want that in a professor. I agree, but I also say this door works both ways. I don't want that for my students. You cannot skip steps. If it doesn't look readable or confusing, then I'm not gonna give points for it. Um, it's a closed book. You could bring crayons as a highlighter. I'm very flexible on what you bring to the test. Uh, don't write your test in crayon, um, but there's all sorts of ways that you can do this. Um, if this is the biggest thing, the 214s know this. If the answer is written on the test, as in the physical copy of the test, but not written correctly or at all on the Scantron, it will not count. We're playing by MCAT rules. Would the MCAT give you points for putting the right answer on the test booklet, but not the Scantron that you turn in? No, it wouldn't. So we're playing by those rules. In, at the bottom of every page, it says, 
Work and answers on this page will not be graded. In fact, what I really should do, <sighs> I'm paying attention to who signs in here because if they complain about it on Thursday, I'll be like, you were in the room when Dr. Eschenberg said, this work won't count. Um, and if you weren't in the room, I'll be like, tough, because you should have been here listening to the rules. Um, hate to sound like a jerk, but after six years, I get bitter. Um, on, we're not gonna do it right now, but again, I'll talk about it. I catch people every single semester for the conversion putting their answers here they will not count i'm telling you now don't do it put it on the loose leaf paper we give you and that those points will count remember at the bottom of every test work and answers whoops work and answers on this page will not be graded I get this every year and I'm not going to give points. So how will you give point, get points? By following instructions. Just put it, and let me tell you why. It's not because I'm a jerk. Because we had to spend countless years reading tests where I, I come in here with two reams of paper. I don't expect to use it all, but I bring paper, a lot of it. And there are people who insist on cramming their answers for a vector addition problem in the freaking margins and expect me to read this. They write it in a three-point font and go, oh, it just makes sense to me. No, it doesn't. Write it down on a clean sheet of paper like a human. So don't do that. Um, I would appreciate it if on your paper, the homework, or not the homework, but the, um, the answers for the test, the work for the test, don't write in the upper left hand corner. You will be get, or you will bring a green Scantron. On the green Scantron, put your name, student ID, if you want to date, it's the name and the student ID we're really after. As long as you put your name in the name section and your student ID in any other section, it will be fine. What I don't want, notice here, it's got a name, student ID, and version. Um, for this room, what we'll probably end up doing, because they're not, there's not 215 students, is what we'll initially do is like, these rows fill these rows first, then these, 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 and then we'll skip. So in the back, there's going to be a desk between every student. As more students come in, then we'll fill the first row, then the second row, then the third. So the, the full rows will be closest to the professor. Um, let's see. There will be multiple versions of the test. Multiple. In fact, it, this is an example of a version test. I don't know why I gave these kids a version, because this was the summer and there was only like 50 of them. I'll put somewhere on the test something that signifies which version it is, and then I tell you to write that version down on your Scantron and on the test. You have to write that down. Don't do what Doug did. Doug wrote Doug on the front of the text and the Scantron. No student ID, no version number, nothing. Just Doug. So two graders in me looked for Doug, couldn't find him. There was no Douglas as a first name, middle name, no Doug, nothing. Well, we found Doug. Doug was his nickname. Put only the name that my old miss knows you by on that, on that test. Put, all, put your student ID on that test. The whole point of it is to figure out who you are. So that's the key thing. If we waste like a week of time trying to track down Doug, it takes time away from grading and that makes us upset. Also, there will be multiple versions of the test. It won't be 
apparent initially what versions they are. Because I may take three or four versions of the test and then shuffle it like a deck of cards. And let me tell you why this is done. It's only because, you get, well, you sat over there and used these four. What happens traditionally is I go, all right, version A here, version A there, version C here, version A there, and it's all in columns. But what I figured out what was happening, at the end of the row, I count, and I know how many people are in this row. So I put eight tests for the eight people, and only six of them get towards the middle, and the last two run out of tests, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. What was happening, I give you a stack of test A, I give you a stack of test B, you pass all yours behind. You keep two and pass the rest behind. And then you take yours, and you hand it to one of them and hit his desk. So now you two have the same version. I finally figured this out. In a way, uh, I have to operate as a counterintelligence CIA officer. You guys escalate, not saying you cheat, but I have to take certain steps. So I randomly look under hoods and hats. I take your calculator and I lift the stuff off the back just to make sure there are no notes there. It's to keep people honest, it's to keep things on an even playing field, and it's to adequately test your knowledge. Do you really want your doctor or pharmacist to have cheated through basic physics? No, because if they're gonna cheat through that, you want them to know the difference between heart medication and diabetes medication. Kind of important. So let, this is one of the reasons why. I have the right, as the professor, to just move people randomly. Don't take it personally. Sometimes I do it on a whim. Other times I think they're a problem. Next, when you come in, bring your book bags to the front, to the very back. No book bags at your desk. No phones on you. If I find a phone on you, even if it's in your pocket, that's 20% off your test. If you're using the phone during the test, let's not get in. If the phone goes off in your bag at the front, do me a courtesy, go up to the front, get your phone, turn it off, get back to your seat, everything will be fine. I won't be offended at all. If you have to go to the bathroom, what's really gonna happen we're going to hand the tests out. All the tests will get distributed. I will hand all the paper out. It will get distributed. I'll put the paper up front. If you need more paper, don't ask. Just come up and get it. If you're going to the restroom, come up. Don't go to the restroom here. Put your tests on the table. Leave the room. And then do whatever you got to do. I, I'm, I'm totally fine with people using the restroom during tests. Um, when you get done with your tests, typically there will be three versions. They will be labeled at the front of the table. Let's just say A, B, and C. There will be a stack for tests and a stack for Scantron. <coughs> Put the Scantron in the appropriate stack. Put the test in the appropriate stack. If you staple the Scantron to the test, I will take your GPA out in front of the class and inflate it. For the medical students, they understand what the, and, and chefs, they will understand what the word flay means. And I will do it slowly. Do not staple the Scantron to the test. A, B, and C, and then you put it in the appropriate pot and you head out, and then that's it. And then the assignment for this weekend, do nothing physics related. Is that gonna be difficult? No, we're gonna be on that. Watch baseball, do whatever. Um, in terms of the mechanics of the test, do we have any further questions? All right, one of the things that I will stress on is, right now, I'm your biggest fan. Love you guys, I'll do any, well, almost any. For you. I won't tell you what's on the test before, that's obvious. But um, during the test, I have to remain neutral. So you're allowed to ask questions. If it's a question like, am I doing it right? 
Or, no, sir, I'm not going to ask how I'm doing, am I doing it right, but am I doing it right? Questions like that will receive the answer, it is a correctly constructed problem. I've already done the test. Well, I haven't written the test, but by the test time, I will have written it, <coughs> proofed it, done it, I'll be ready. Um, questions like, if you honestly think that the problem is missing a quantity, you can ask. And if I respond, it is correctly constructed, you understand what that means. If I go, whoops, and then start working furiously, that means it's an honest mistake. But probably it is a one in 10 chance that there will be something wrong. There's always nitpicky things on multiple choice. Um, sometimes, like, D is left blank, or C scrolls off the page. They're practical things like that. that um, I'm perfectly happy correcting that. But in terms of, am I doing it right? No, I can't answer that. And it's because I answered someone's question incorrectly, and then crushed them for it when I graded it, uh, that it, it forced my hand, and I became, I had to be neutral. It's, and don't worry, I'll, if, if worse comes to worse, I'll curve it a little bit or do whatever. That's necessary. It's not, it's not that bad. All right, let's take a look. Oh, last rule. I call it, now, the neutrality rule used to be called um, the James rule, because his name was James. This is the Meg rule. Meg, on one test, took all the answers that I requested and wrote every single answer in furlongs per fortnight and forced me to figure out if she got the answer right, which she did. Um, but when now I've got, the, this is the snark rule or the anti-Meg rule and um, Use everything in, in terms of what I ask for. Meters, kilograms, seconds, newtons. Those are probably it. All right. Whew. I know it makes me seem like a jerk, but this is, I have to say all the rules. Otherwise, you guys say, he didn't tell us this. Um, top of the front page, the traditional list of equations. Um, I may beef it up. I don't know. It, uh, there's really not many basic equations that you need. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to work through these and do the multiple choice. Distance is the absolute value of displacement. Now, in some of these tests, there is a figure Oops, I gotta back this up. So, mg cosine theta for figure two is what value? On this sketch, one of these is mg cosine theta. Which one? It's three, yes. So three is mg cosine theta. Now, number three for the multiple choice is I wouldn't call it tricky, it just tests your knowledge of what's going on. Now, units of coefficient of friction are normally is expressed <coughs> as units of blank. What is blank? It's not A. Now you're guessing. Now traditionally, now let me ignore the multiple choice for just a second. The units of co coefficient of friction are what? None. There are none. So what we're looking for is a situation where the numerator cancels with the denominator. It's got to be B. Newtons are on one side, and what is in the other? Kilograms, meters per second per second. And that's what it is. Using figure one. Oh, I love these. Wait, why is um, number three B? Three 
Uh, now this is, let me blow up the font just a little bit. Ah, come on, get back in gear. Try to see if it can focus on that. What we're looking for is where numerator and denominator have the same units. It can't be D or C, because those don't even attempt to cancel. If the numerator in A, B, and E are Newton, we're looking for another expression of Newton in the denominator. So a Newton can be expressed as kilogram meter per second per second. That's B. <coughs> so does that answer? Person on. Yes. <coughs> Number two was, oh, this is where people would go, uh, I think there's a mistake here. Which one do I pick? Um, hopefully by then I'll have proofed everything. The answer is three. So either C or E was an acceptable answer. And I would let them know. Um, one of the things that I do on tests where I realize I'm in a situation like two is I say the right answer is the first answer that's correct. So in this case, the answer would be C, because C happens before E. But by then, hopefully by um, Thursday afternoon, I will have proved this enough that it works. Uh, to those of you in the track team who won't be here on test day, I will talk to you guys probably on Friday. Most likely what's gonna happen with you guys is you'll take the test um, outside my office on Monday or Tuesday. That's my best guess. We'll set up times later. Um, so using figure one, E is acceleration, which one could be velocity? Oop, let me back this up. Dang it, this is. If E is acceleration, which one is velocity? D. D. E is a negative constant value. So the slope of the line that we're looking for must be consistent and negative. The only one in, in this um, list is D. The value of E is negative. And when I say, and this is, um, this would be a valid question, and let me give you the answer that I would be looking for. You would say, well, which line is the axis and which line is the plot? Totally valid question. And in this, all the lines with arrows are the plot lines, and the lines without arrows are the axes. So it, it clarifies. And I would say that that's a valid question to ask. Also, um, another answer or another um, bit of advice. When you ask a question about the test, and I have deemed it necessary that the entire class knows what's going on with your question, I will speak in this type level of voice, a voice that can fill the room. If it's something specific that I don't think is necessary, I'll keep it quiet so that people can understand that you won't be disturbed. But if it's like, if it's like, well, what are the arrows and what are the plots? I'll go, just so the class knows, the lines are the axes and the arrowed lines are the plots. I'm not trying to make fun of you by your question. I'm speaking in a loud voice because you've asked a good question. Now, if it's a question where the answer is um, that's a correctly constructed question, I will fill the room because you are deserving of public scorn. So that's, that's how it works. Um, number five, in an Atwoods machine, the masses accelerate at different rates. They never accelerate 
at different rates but identical velocities at the same rate or at the same rate but different velocities? No, it's D. They accelerate at the same rate. That's all you And not only do they accelerate at the same rate, they have the same velocities. So convert two meters into centimeters. So two meters into centimeters. Scientific notation conversion. Hmm? A. It's A. One meter has 100 centimeters. 100 is 10 to the second power. Number seven, 200 micrograms is equivalent to It's A. 200 is equal to 2 times 10 to the 2. So 200 micrograms is 200 times 10 to the negative 6. And that is 2 times 10 to the negative 4 grams. As long as you put the answer on the Scantron, it's, I, don't, I don't mind how you get it. Because in, in questions like these, it's kind of an all or nothing type thing. If you write, now let's say this, just as a hypothetical. If you write this down, you get the right answer, but you enter or don't enter the right answer on the Scantron, it won't count. It has to be right selection on the Scantron. For something like this, your work, however you do it, is up to you. Number eight, Chad Kelly throws a football to Coach Freeze. There is no wind resistance. The ball experiences acceleration. That is what? Only vertical. Remember in ballistics, acceleration and ballistics as in you shoot the object through the air or throw the ball through the air. It's only under the influence of gravity. Gravity only acts downward and only in the vertical axis. Negative 3x hat minus 3y hat is a what quadrant vector? Third. Let me make sure I got. Okay. Which of the following in ten is a fourth quadrant vector? C, positive x, negative y. Normal force is always blank to the surface. What is blank? Perpendicular. A book rests on the table. You push down on the book. The normal force does what? It increases. The normal force is the force from the table on the object. When you push harder or push at all on the stapler, the table pushes back harder. If it didn't push as hard, it would go into the table itself. Negative 2x hat is what in polar notation? A, 2 meters at 180. Kilogram is a unit of mass. Symbol for coefficient of friction is E for mu. Convert two nanometers into meters. C, negative nine. I would say 10 to the negative three, six, and nine, and 10 to the three, 
or negative three, negative six, and negative nine are all valid questions to ask for conversions. So on um, the small side, milli, micro, nano. On the big side, kilo, uh, mega, giga. And that's probably as far as I'm willing to go. Uh, Chad Kelly throws a ball to Coach Freeze. Which of the following is a valid velocity vector when the ball is at its highest point? So he throws the ball. It arcs. There's a point at which it's at the top of the arc. Which is the valid vector? And it should be for the velocity vector. So it has to be only horizontal, which is B. C is a vertical vector. A is a vector in, that's not in the horizontal. D and E are both vertical, so the only answer left is B. Chad Kelly throws the football to Coach Freeze. Which of the following values is zero when the ball is at its highest point? B, vertical velocity. At the top of the curve, there is only horizontal velocity. Quick pop quiz. What is Coach Freeze's major at Southern Miss? At first, I was like, do you know why I don't coach football? Because I don't know... How to coach football. Do you know why Freeze doesn't teach physics? He doesn't, he doesn't know anything about physics. But someone did mention he has this degree. Not physics. Kind of close. He actually has a bachelor's in math. Which is freaky. So, for a jock. But it does show, I mean, people do surprise other people. I, I had no idea. Because the biggest thing that I talk about is... Let me guess, your physics teacher was the football coach. For literally, he could be the math teacher and the football coach at the same time and do a good job at both. So, figure one. Uh, figure one, were, which plot represents velocity if B is acceleration? So B is acceleration, which one is velocity? A. B is a positive acceleration and constant. Therefore, the slope of velocity should be constant. Um, you spin, uh, spin a ball, it makes two revolutions. How many degrees did it rotate? 720, or E. Each rotation, 360 degrees. Two meters at 180 is what in component notation? Negative 2x hat, so it's got to be E. Now, you drop an object, and I'll clarify this. What is its initial acceleration the moment you've lost any physical contact with the object? It has to be C, negative 10 meters per second per second. It's under the influence of gravity. Zero is the snarky answer. And... We have a rule for the anti-snark or anti-meg. Um, e represents acceleration. Which one is position? Uh, in fact, I would accept. I'd accept two answers for this, and I'll have to clarify. Um, what? If E is acceleration, which of the following are valid? G and F. Because with the negative acceleration, that position has a steep slope initially, and then it, it, it comes to a flat. Much like if you threw an object up in the air, it would arc up and then stop it would arc up and then eventually it would come back down. So I would accept either G or F. G is not written quite right, but F is. Um, in fact, I think the way that I argued it is F is not listed on the list. So 
the answer obviously would be G. You throw a ball into the air, which of the following is a valid acceleration vector for the ball at its highest point? C, it has to be C. 270 degrees is straight down. For figure two, which one is friction force? One. One is the friction force. It is opposite of velocity. I think probably what it could do is draw something like this, call it six, see if anyone bites and tells. But if velocity is down, friction force is up. So it's one. And so that's the multiple choice. What's gonna happen is I'll find, uh, actually for 213, your test has all the versions included. So you've got all the multiple choice, really. Uh, at the review session tomorrow, what um, after this class, what I'll do is I'll post um, fall 213's um, test one, just so you can see the most current tests that was made. Um, and then we'll go over it a little bit. These are the problems. Test one is incredibly predictable. Not in terms of the specific problems, but the topics. Appetizer, conversion, done. That's it. That's all I'm gonna do on the appetizer. Test one for 213 is the most obvious test on the planet. Why is that? You've never had a physics test before. Many of you have never taken physics before. So the first test is kind of a diagnostic, trying to figure out who, the, the strong students from the weak students. And what, I, what this tends to do is, it's a lot like, it's a lot like kind of, you just, you're sparring with someone and you hit them and you wanna see if they, how well they can take the hit. Sometimes I've hit the class and it goes, all right, I'm ready for some more. And other times I hit them and it's like, oh, dude, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and if that happens on the first test, which I know, which may happen, I hopefully it won't, I'll adjust the second test accordingly. If the first test just bombs, second test, I'll try to make it a little bit easier and we'll keep on working on it. I will admit the other thing has happened. I had a summer test. The class said, oh, we're so, they lowballed me. They sandbagged me. They said, oh, we're so dumb. We don't understand anything. And I made that test so stinking easy. About 50% of the class got over a 90. 25% of the class got over a 100. There were people high-fiving each other in the hall. And I just sat there and I was like, okay, have a good time. And don't worry, I can fix this. And um, on the second test, I just crushed them. And then the averages went back into a normal situation. We're all fine. So it, uh, it, it's a lot like you may hear phrases from me saying the class is running hot or the class is running cold. Class is running hot, the grades are too high. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta bump up. I much, this is my philosophy. I'd much rather curve up because people would start jumping off buildings if I curved down. So I'd much rather give the test so that the um, that'd be a great like Halloween story. Dr. Esch, here's the Halloween story, it's just one sentence. He curved down. Ooh, and then everybody would just lose their mind. If, um, if I say the grades are running cold, which most likely they will, because you guys are new, um, that just means that the second test will be easier, or easier than what I was intending. So it's, the first test is kind of a diagnostic thing. Not here all the time. But as an undergrad at my school, I made a 40 out of 100 one time, and they told me it was a B. And then another time, I made a 90, yeah, 
and they said it was a C. And I was like, the bleep is this all about? And, uh, and so I know, but that, that was just the way it rolled. And so you just had to accept it or transfer. So that's like, that's a weapon that's under sealed glass that requires two people to turn the keys in case it's needed, only under zombie attack. I'd pull out the curve down, but I don't see that ever happening. I mean, that would have to be. In the summer, it was a 50% Yeah, that was, the, that was the big performance. That was the big test. Yeah, they totally ruined it for everybody else for the rest of time. Um, because I, uh, the first, all right, it's enough about that. Conversion, vector addition, 2D motion, Atwood's machine, done. The 213 test, I'm not going to pull this trick again. The 213 test from the fall, I was like, man, I don't want to write another test. So I took the test from fall of 2015, Xerox it, and just changed the date. Because it's so boring. This test is boring. But it does hit the major points in introductory physics. Can you convert? Let's do that. Eight cubic meters an hour to cubic inches per second. First thing I do is I'm going to convert the, um, the time first. The next thing I do is I'm going to convert cubic meters to cubic centimeters. And then remember when you do this to convert or to cube the numbers, meters, meters, centimeters, centimeters, inches cubed are left, hours, hours, minutes, minutes, seconds are left. So this just becomes... This just becomes 8 times 100 cubed divided by 60 times 60 times 2.54 cubed. So 135.6 cubic inches per second. And that's it. I would leave it like that. I would even be fine with 136 cubic inches per second. And that would be as many sig things. Don't, now the true answer, let me see if I can get the calculator to do it, is 135.6083202. Don't write all that out. Just four digits would be fine. That's, that's all I really need. Um, three is as few as I really need. Four is as most as I really need. And let's keep it like that. Uh, I would accept even uh, scientific notation. So if you wrote 1.36 times 10 to the 2 cubic inches per second, I'd be fine with that. Really, the only time that I use um, scientific notation is if it's over 1,000. If it's in the 10,000s and above, I would use that. Vector addition. I want... Oh my goodness, I asked for a resultant and equilibrium. That's okay. A is 5 meters at 90 degrees. B is 6 meters at 210. Add them up and go. One of these is going to be an instant conversion vector, so you need to be able to recognize it. Is the instant A or B? A. A converts immediately. 90 degrees is pure Y hat. So, positive 5y hat. And that's it. If we, in the middle, 
In the middle of problems, I do not care about units unless I'm unit checking. Yeah. For stuff like this, I don't write down meters. I don't make it look pretty. Six meters at 210 is a what quadrant vector? Third. Third quadrant, draw X, Y. Always draw your X, then your Y. X, Y, reference angle. The reference angle for a second quadrant vector is the absolute angle minus 180. So reference is 210 minus 180 or 30 degrees. Now X is B cosine theta R or 6 cosine 30. And 6 cosine 30, 5.196. I go with a few extra sig figs during problems because I don't like losing hunks of information. Y is B sine reference angle, which is 6 sine 30. Love multiples of 30. Why do I love multiples of 30? Because the sine of 30 is 1 half. I don't need to use math. Um, so this is three. Now it is a third quadrant. So the magnitudes are 5.196 X hat and three Y hat. But since it's third quadrant, the minus signs go out front. Don't let the minus signs tell you what to do. You're the one who's going to tell the minus signs what to do. In your calculator, you should for adding vectors, you should never ever use or receive a negative number. Because in my system, in the reference system, it makes no use of negative signs. Negative signs are only used by your application of logic. C vector, negative 5.196 x hat plus 2 y hat close parentheses meters. That is the resultant in component. The equilibrant, most likely I'm thinking is um, equilibrants won't be on the test. I mean, we all know what it is. All it does is just sink time into it. Um, 5.196. I will say that you need to know what the relationship between resultant and equilibrant are. So just know that the equilibrant is opposite of the resultant. If you add an equilibrant and a resultant together, you get zero, that kind of stuff. It's a third quadrant, uh, I'm sorry, the resultant is what quadrant? Second, negative x, positive y, means that the absolute angle is gonna be between 90 and 180. So, x, y, so this is C, this is the y component magnitude, x component magnitude, reference angle. Uh, C is equal to x squared, y squared, summed up and square rooted. So 5.196 squared plus 2 squared, add that up. C is 5.57 meters. Can you look it up? Yeah, I'm, and that, uh, yes. The reference angle is inverse tan of y over x. So this is inverse tan of y2 over x, 5.196. 21 degrees. 21.1, big deal. 
What we're looking for is procedure. Do you understand? The graders know that I'm not a fan of the numbers. If you said 5.57, great. If you said 5.5 or 5.6, we'd be more happy with 5.6. If you said 21 degrees or 21.1 degrees, we're fine with either. If you said your reference angle was 185, now we got issues. Yes. Remember what I said not three minutes ago. You never use the minus sign when calculating reference angles. You never use the minus sign at all in your calculator and you will never get the minus sign. What's your question? Okay. If you add 180 to that. Well, I have, I'm not done yet. Okay. I'm getting there. What do I, now for a second quadrant angle, how do I get the absolute angle from it? 180 minus the reference. So 180 minus 21 is 159. So the answer is 5.57 at 159 degrees. Now, all you would do for the equilibrant is just add 180 degrees and then you got it for the other one. So in this case, it's D is 5.57 at uh, 180, 3, 4, 330, 331. I think it's 330. Is it 330? Hold on. 159, we're from, we're from Mississippi. We have to use a calculator on this. 339. So that's the equilibrium. Just add 180 to it and you're good. That's it. That's a vector addition. Notice that the way that you reassemble your uh, vector is different for each of the quadrants. But a couple of key things. When you're drawing your triangles, you always draw X then Y x and y. So if I drew the axes for these things, look kind of like that. x then y. Therefore, all the numbers that you use in your calculator and all the numbers that you receive from your calculator will be positive under all circumstances. But no, always positive. It's only your logic that applies the negative signs. Only, you never put in a negative sign into your calculator. If, if, you put it in there, if you put it in there, what I'm saying is, there are many different ways to do things. We're all different. Can't we enjoy, just enjoy the fact that we can do physics problems in all sorts of different ways? Yes, even I admit that. But the problem is, if you start jumping off the path and just roaming through the wilderness and your face gets eaten by a velociraptor, don't come crying to me. This set procedure has evolved after how many years of me teaching this? How long have I been teaching this? It's rude to ask. That's how long. Um, but it's been polished. The first time I taught this, things were kind of shaky and we were kind of... It's a very simplified way. For those of you who are taking 214 in the summer, um, there's a set, there's a, a problem called Kirchhoff's Laws. There is one way, and it's the one time where I'm very militant about it in how you do this. Adding vectors, I'm almost as militant about it. You're allowed to do many different things, but once again, if you come back and you've got no face, because it's in the stomach of a velociraptor, it's not my problem. All right, any questions on vector addition? Okay, two-dimensional motion. Uh, flat surface, awesome flat surface. Uh, two-dimensional motion, it will not be quadratic. You probably could use quadratic, but the problem itself, I will guarantee that there is a way to do the problem without the quadratic solution. 
This one is obvious because the surface is at the same level. Two-dimensional motion. First thing you do is you write these. A is negative 10. There is no uh, horizontal acceleration. We haven't really read the problem yet. But in this situation, I'm looking for V naught and T and then I want the max height. I added that because I felt that the test at the time was a little on the light side. Um, this is This is a summer test. Let me tell you about summer tests. Summer tests, I used to give a test in the first hour because summer school is two hours per class. And then in the second hour of the test, I would, or the second hour of the class, I would actually give a class. So we would take a, a test for 60 minutes and then we would lecture for 60 minutes. And did you know what I saw during that 60 minutes of, of lecture? A whole room of people who hated me because they had just gotten out of a test. They did not want to talk about physics. So fine, so I rewrote the tests from then on to expand to an hour and a half and give them the full two hours. So they, all they had to do was just get up, leave, and then wait for lab. In this um, test, it may seem that it's a little bit too long and it's mainly because of this. Um, I looked at the test and felt that they would get done a little bit more quickly. So I just added that. What I'm gonna do is I'll do this as written, but this would be a valid, this would be a valid spring problem. That's a valid summer problem. So it, I added a little bit of weight to it. Step one, find origin there. Apply origin conditions. X naught and Y naught are zero. Rewrite the terms to take into account that the velocity is actually part of a triangle. V naught x, V naught cosine theta t y equals V naught sine theta t plus one half a t squared. One of the other things that I forgot to apply in terms of initial conditions is the fact that when it returns to Earth, Y is also zero. So zero equals all of this. I'm going to attack the problem for a little bit. Because one of the reasons that makes this a very nice problem is that the problem is not quadratic and I'm left with negative V naught sine theta is equal to one half a t. So now I have two equations. The two unknowns are V naught and T. One of the problems on your test will be a two equation, two unknown. For the class over the summer, it was this problem and everybody died a little more inside. Um, I'd solve for, uh, solve for V naught. Uh, X over T cosine theta is equal to V naught. So that makes this minus X over T cosine theta sine theta equals one half A T. Uh, sine over cosine is tangent, bring the t up, and I'm left with negative x tan theta equals one-half a t squared. Solve for time. Everything is known. Minus 2x tan theta over a is equal to t squared, so square root of minus 2x tan theta over a is equal to t. The t got squared because of when I went from there to there, I multiplied both sides by t. Because yes, the t squared did go away and now it's back. Why? Because multiplying this side by t 
eliminates the t value over here. Multiplying that side by t, t goes to t squared. Yes, in the back. Okay, good. Plug and chug, minus 2, 64, tan 30. A is negative uh, 10, and that will give you time. When I do these problems, I normally um, put them through a spreadsheet and play with the numbers until I can get a number that I like. Um, I'm not sure if this I did the same thing here. Time is equal to 2.718 seconds. So 2.72 or whatever. Plug that in here. X is 64, which is an odd number. T is 2.718. Cosine of 30 is equal to V naught. And I've got the answer still keyed in. So I can get an exact answer which doesn't look any better, 27.2, or 27.18 uh, meters per second. So there, it's just to buy a factor of 10. Um, that's the velocity and time, and that's what, that would be a valid, um, that would be a valid uh, 2D motion. For max height, I mean, we could do that later, but the only thing you would really ask for is find time by Vy equaling zero, which is equal to V naught Y plus AT. And you solve for that time. But in a situation like this, summer, summer, summer tests were two hours long. This thing is an hour 15 minutes long. I'm gonna have to make cuts. I would say max height on a 2D motion problem. I don't have enough time for something like that. So I'm gonna skip it. Last bit, Atwood's machine. Okay. Atwood's machine. Standard Atwood's machine with friction, boo friction. You're gonna have two equations. I want to see this set up if the uh, student or if the grader does not see this setup, he will grade accordingly. And by grade accordingly, I mean flay it. Um, you do the steps, sum the forces in Y is equal to zero, which is equal to Fn minus Mg. Last fall, there was an external force on this thing. Um, Mostly because the room was filled with pre-meds and pharmacy majors. I'm thinking I'm going to do a straightforward Kirchhoff's law, or not Kirchhoff's, Atwood's machine. Normal force is mg, friction force, which is mu sub k times normal force is mu sub k mg. Um, so we've done the first two steps. Step three, find, um, find acceleration for this guy. Sum of the forces in X, which is equal to M1A is equal to um, tension, because it's to the right, minus friction force, it's to the left. So this is M1A equals T minus mu sub K, M1G. All of these are involving mass one. This is as far as I can get on this particular mass. We've set up the equations. I've got to set it up for the other thing. Tension, mg. I don't have to worry about friction nor normal force because the object is not resting on anything. It's just held up by a cable. That's mass two. So I can head straight to number uh, step three. Some of the forces in the plane of motion, which in this case is Y, is M2A, which is equal to minus tension plus M2G. One of the things that you really have to be careful with this is the fact that in our loopy-droopy number line, 
up is minus and down is positive. Just as over here, left is minus, right is positive. It's because you've taken the number line and bent it 90 degrees. This as far as we can go, this is one equation, two unknowns. This is another equation with two unknowns. It's a two equation, two unknown problem. We eliminate tension. So M1A plus mu sub K M1G is equal to tension. And I'm going to plug this into here. M2A equals minus M1A minus mu sub K M1G plus M2G. Move that over. M2A. It may be that I just asked for the numerical value of acceleration. M2A plus M1A equals minus mu sub K M1G plus M2G. Factor out A's and G's. A, M2 plus M1, G. Uh, G, M2 minus mu sub K M1. And A is G M2 minus mu sub K M1 over M2 plus M1. Now in this particular case, M1, M2, mu sub K, and G are all knowns. G is the magnitude of gravity, 10. M2 is 20. Mu sub K, 0.1. M1, 6, M2, 20, M1, 6. The way that the Atwoods machines are set up is that acceleration will be positive in the problem and it must be between 0 and 10. So 20 minus 0.6 times 10 divided by 26. And I get 7.46 meters per second squared. Now in this particular case, I have acceleration. I'm looking for time. The initial velocity is zero. So it becomes a one dimensional motion problem. V naught is equal to zero. Up is negative, down is positive. That length is 20, which we'll just call X. <coughs> x equals x naught, which is zero because it starts at the origin, we declare it, plus v naught t, which is zero because it's initially at rest, plus one half a t squared. I'm looking for time. 2x over a is equal to t squared, so the square root of 2x over a is equal to t. Square root of 2 times 20, which is uh, 40, divided by 7.46 is equal to time. Just trying to rush. We got base, or I'm not going to go, but there's baseball. I got stuff. Sorry. I'm not a super fan. I'm just an uber fan. All right, 2.31 seconds. That's the time. Now, it's a very straightforward problem. What could I possibly do? Well, let me talk to you guys and reward those who... A, show up, or B, you listen to this entire video lecture. What could possibly happen? You know I don't like people who plug and chug. What could I possibly do to mess this thing up for the plug and chuggers? This is what I love to do. I would set up everything as is, but instead of giving you specific masses, I wouldn't give you masses. I would simply say, M2 is unknown, and M1 is M2 over 10. And I would throw that at you and watch you guys go insane. The first time I did it, the prof I did it in the professor voice. Let's see what they could do with it. Answer, melt down and cry. But let me show you, and they said to me, this is impossible, it can't be done. Well, fine, this is why the alphabet soup method is superior to plug and chug. Take this equation. 
take M1 and replace it with M2 over 10. Factor out the M2s. And what you see is that why did I not give you M1 or M2? Because it was unnecessary. It's more important to understand the ratio of the masses than the specific masses themselves. Now, had I asked for tension, had I asked for the friction force on uh, M1, had I asked for specific values of the force, yes, I would have to give you those masses. But if I only asked for acceleration, all you have to do is sub it in. And if on this particular problem, that was almost the birthplace of it is a correctly constructed problem, that phrase. That's it. See you tomorrow, 4 o'clock at the review session. It will be recorded. Don't take off.